This week marks the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 15 mission, so we're joined by historian Francis French to talk all about that legendary mission. And while Emily is at Oshkosh for Air Ventures, I do my very best to get you up to date with all that's happening in the world of spaceflight. Please do get in contact with your own thoughts or perhaps even memories of Apollo 15. We're at Space and Things One on Twitter and Space and Things Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. There's also a contact form on our website, which is Space and Things Podcast.com. And don't forget to hit that share button. It really does help us out. But right now, please enjoy episode 48 of the Space and Things Podcast. Oh my God. Listening to Space and Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles, and welcome to episode 48. As Dave said in the introduction, this week I'm hosting a panel at Air Venture in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. So we recorded the majority of this episode a few weeks back, but Dave will deliver the news and his best BBC voice later on. Well, I'll do my very best, Emily. Uh, (laughs) I don't know what that was. Anyway, uh, we looked ahead in the diary and saw that the 50th anniversary of Apollo 15 happened to be this week. So we decided to ask our friend Francis French, another Brit, to come and join us to talk more about that mission. A perfect assignment for him, given that he's written not one, not two, but three books with the Apollo 15 command module pilot, Al Warden. We last had Francis on for our special edition of the podcast as we celebrated the life of Michael Collins. So it's nice to bring him back in happier circumstances. He really is wonderful. Enjoy. Deep three minus one. Contact. Man. Okay, you student of Falcon is on the plane at Hadley. Roger, Roger, Falcon. Welcome, Francis. Thank you very much for joining us once again, this time to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Apollo 15. Now, this is a mission which I personally think often gets overlooked by the general public. And in fact, for years, as a younger person, the only thing I could have told you about it was there was some story about stamps that got him in trouble. But today, let's not talk about that. Let's talk about the mission. So can you set the scene for us and Give us a little bit of background behind the mission. Absolutely. The the thing about this mission and 16 and 17, the last three missions that landed on the moon to date, which is terrifying, is Britain's got this. Americans forgot about them, but the British, the European, they followed this. And if you look at the headlines of the time, people were driving cars around on the moon. They were doing extended expeditions into valleys. They were launching sub-satellites. They were doing EVAs in deep space on the way back from the moon. The European press loved this, but America had kind of overlooked it by that point. They'd seen people land on the moon on Apollo 11. They'd hoped they'd get home on Apollo 13. And then when the next mission didn't have an accident, they're like, okay, I guess everything's good. And it all just sort of petered out. Europe loved this stuff, but it's true. Most of America don't get why this was the high point, not only of space exploration, but probably of human exploration to date. Nobody's done anything more impressive in many ways than this now, half a century later. We haven't really talked to this. So Mm. Apollo 15 was the first of those three. You know, there have been 11 and 12 had landed, 14 had done what 13 had planned to do. Now it was time to kick it up a notch. Now it was time to really do some extended scientific exploration of the moon. They knew how to land. They knew how to do all the flying it was time to actually put that flying to use to actually do something while you're there that's really so much better than before. So now they were going to have a car to drive around on the moon. That meant they could go a lot further than their lunar module landing. They could do things like on Apollo 15, come in at a much steeper angle and land in a valley next to a big rill, next to another big valley, do going to all kinds of places that those earlier missions wanted to land somewhere flat and safe and they didn't dare do stuff like that. This, this is taking it up the next notch. They were experienced. The best part, though, is the, the all the, um, the mission commanders, particularly Dave Scott, these were guys who were incredibly good test pilots and jet pilots, and yet they learned another whole career now. They learned how to do geology, and Dave Scott in particular really took this and went with it. He became essentially a guy with a master's degree in geology as well as being able to land a spacecraft on the moon. And the stuff they did to learn what the moon is about, they're still doing scientific papers from this. So this is 
an incredible mission. And while 16 and 17 were similar, 15 is really yet to be topped. This mission really uh, spotlighted or spotlit so many different types of people, which was kind of cool. First of all, uh, I think it's a, an achievement because of the, obviously the lunar rover. It was the first mission that had the lunar rover. And uh, another interesting thing is how quickly the lunar ve uh, rover was developed and put together. I think it was only like around 18 months or so, which could not be done nowadays. I mean, we see how long nowadays I'm going to get crapped on here, but like SLS, it's taken like over a decade, you know, for them to develop it. And it's understandable. It's a, it's a whole new rocket. Back then, you know, NASA and their contractors were working at an entirely different clip. I think from the moment where they're like, hey, we want a moon car to the moment where they got it on the moon. It was like around 18 months, which is nothing short of insane to me. There is a documentary called Moon Machines, and um, it sort of spotlights all sorts of different, you know, technology from Apollo. And one of the episodes is about the lunar rover. I, I think I watched that episode like a scientist because it is incredible. You get like this whole sense that between Boeing and General Motors, who did the drivetrain, I mean, they're the ones who basically made it. Boeing is the contractor, but they did a lot of the electronics, whereas GM, they, they're the ones who really like, you know, OK, what kind of material do we need to, you know, are we going to use, you know, rubber tires? Or are we going to use a special type of tire on the moon, you know, on the lunar surface? It worked pretty well for the first uh, for the three missions that it flew on. And uh, that to me is just really a sort of a story in itself, which is awesome. And uh, I'm a little biased towards the command module pilot in this story because he was freaking awesome. But um, really, Al Warden got to be like a superstar on Apollo 15. I mean, he was just killing it. Jim and Dave went to go pick up some rocks and they did geology and stuff. And that's really cool. But I mean, Al was taking pictures. He was... He had the Simbe, he had the sub-satellite that he deployed, which I, if I'm not mistaken, I think he was the first person to deploy a satellite um, in space, which is really cool. Uh, that's probably not something a lot of people know because we really didn't get that again until like the shuttle period. And of course, I can't leave out the deep space EVA he did. Um, it's only about 20 minutes long or so. He really was not outside for a long period of time. If you go on YouTube, you can actually watch it. Uh, the first time I watched it, I was so struck at how business-like he is. Super focused. You know, people now, we sort of have this image of Al as being, you know, this funny, joking guy, which is true that I think he was like that in his later life. But I think people really underestimate, you know, what a superstar he was, who was really, I think, underrated until, of course, Falling to Earth came out 10 years ago, which Francis co-wrote, which is... If you haven't read that book yet, you're just behind on everything. That that book is incredible. <laughs> it really is. So, Francis, how did that book come about? So this was the 40th anniversary we were aiming for of Apollo 15. Um, and you know, Jim Irwin was the first of the moonwalkers to die. Um, he, we lost him in the early 90s, but, um, but um, Dave and Al were still around. The 40th was coming up. As I mentioned, I figure this is the most important mission. And, and Al had been wanting to write a book for a long time, um, not just because of what he did on the mission, but also, as you mentioned, about the covers. He wanted to say what happened, and he wanted to essentially put that straight as well. He, he had a burning need to do that. And that was very different from most astronauts I've ever worked with because there are a number of people who've written books, um, not ones I've worked on, where they have been like, you know, look at me, I did this, I got a parade, aren't I wonderful? And that's great because <laughs> they went to the moon. If you if yeah, you can't yeah. celebrate yourself when you went to the moon, who what can you do? Yeah. But that's not what that's not what attracted me to this one. This one was like a King Lear arc of like, you know, triumph and tragedy and redemption, you know, where Al was literally one month being um fated by kings and queens and honored and a couple of months later is, is given less time to clear out of his office and get out of town than most of us would have in any other kind of job, you know, it's like leave within the week. Um, that's a hell of a story. And the most amazing part of the this book was that the book was part of the story, you know, that, that he, he has these wilderness years. He has this gradual climb back to self-respect followed by the respect of his peers. And the last part of his personal journey is to tell the story of what happened. And so, the end of the book is the book, which is pretty unusual. You know, you don't normally get to work with somebody in any field and have that kind of arc of story. And then when 
the book is launched. We're in Washington, D.C. at the National Air and Space Museum. We're uh, having dinner with the head of NASA. And all of a sudden, it's like, well, whatever happened all those years ago, it's forgotten and he's back. You know, it was it was a real a real sense of relief for him. I think he had this burning need to get this off his chest. And when he did, I, I am fortunate to not just think, but to know that the last 10 years of his life were a lot happier because of that, because he'd done that. And people like Emily, who didn't know that story at the time, read that got to know him after that book came out. And so he was seen in a very, very different way. So I was very honored and lucky to work with him on that book. And uh, of course, this year now we have two other books coming out together, which is uh, bittersweet because we lost him last year, um, mm -hmm. but the books were essentially finished. And so when people thought, well, that's the last we're going to hear from him. No, there's there's still things coming out later this year where he will. Al's not had the final word yet, which will, which will be fun. Emily's read the second one. Emily's even in the second one, which is kind of fun because Al talked about Emily too. So uh, nice. that's going to be a real treat for people. Wow. Yeah, that was, wow. It was mind blowing because, uh, yeah, when I read, Fall oh my God. Oh God. When I read Falling to Earth, uh, that book just, it had such a visceral like effect on me because I honestly, like, Dave, I don't know if Dave knows this story. I, I knew what had happened. But it was something that I'd read on sort of like Wikipedia. Yeah. I'd gotten that version of it. I did. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. But when I read Falling to Earth and this stuff was like verifiable stuff, this wasn't just, you know, stuff that Al said, not that it wouldn't have been truthful, if he, but it was stuff that you could go like in a congressional record and look for. And it was there. When I got to the climactic point, in the book i literally just physically was st i i like threw the book at the wall <laughs> um i was so upset when i read that part of the book i was like i don't want to read this damn book anymore i'm done this is it i'm not going back to it we're done and then the next day i came <laughs> finally i picked it up and i i came back to it the next day and i did finish it it was just such an impactful book for me i'll shut up now man i'm too enthusiastic about this subject go read the book just 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 read the book if you haven't done it yet you just get it now just if you don't have the money steal it or steal the money <laughs> somehow and just get it anyway it's so, these things called libraries emily it's okay you don't have to steal the book oh, go we'll go to a library but if you don't have a library near you i give you move. it's okay if you don't have a library day you move house <laughs> Jeez, who doesn't have a library they're in the wrong place we're going to get sued because I'm it's like Emily Carney, uh space blogger has encouraged people to rob people today. <laughs> Amazing. The reason Emily's in this next book, The Light of Earth, which which I imagine will be um, Al's final word is because Al has watched over the last 40 years what's happened to the space community and it's a fascinating insight into that because the second book is not about what he did as an astronaut. It's about what it's like to be an astronaut, which sounds similar, but it's actually completely different. You know, going to these shows where at one time the people who would talk to him were into the science and technology. And by the time you get to Emily's generation, there's people showing up who are into the astronauts. They're into them as human beings. They're into them as personalities. They want to hear the stories. They want to get to know the people. So the reason Emily's in the books, because and, and a couple of other people he mentions too, is because uh I was looking at this going like, this is different. These people who were born when I was at NASA are now wanting to know all this stuff. It's like a whole new deal. So that's kind of why, you know, things like this podcast are, are so different because we're not talking about what the, uh, the specifications of the rocket are and stuff like that. We're talking human stories, very, very different world. Yeah. Talking of, um, can you tell me the, uh, the differences in the Saturn V for Apollo 15, please? I can actually, I can even tell you about ullage <laughs> motors if you want. There is one interesting bit of that though, about what Emily talked about, which is, you know, they go from Apollo 11 where they're every little inch and ounce is shaved and like the toothbrushes are to like, I think we can squeeze a car on the side yeah. of this spacecraft, concertinaed <laughs> on the side. I mean, they were a lot more confident about that rocket by the time of Apollo 15 and how much it could carry. This was the heaviest mission they'd done to that point. So there is some, some interesting stuff to talk about heavy rockets there too, because uh, they, yeah, they were like, we'll take a car now. That's how confident we are. Yeah, on top of the fact they were there for a few extra days. So they needed more oxygen and food and all those other things. You said they were shaving things down on Apollo 11 to really make the weight. And then they had this confidence that they knew what the rocket could do and they found new ways to to make sure that they could maximize these missions. So um, obviously they were there longer. How many EVAs, how many moonwalks uh, 
did Jim and Dave get to do when they were on the moon? They did three, um, as I recall, out on the surface, but Dave added another one. He's doing all this geology training. We really should mention Lee Silver, the um, geologist from Caltech um, up in Pasadena Mm. who trained these guys. And Dave saw this um, happening. They had Jack Schmidt from, you know, the only geologist who ever walked on the moon as one of their backup uh, crew members. So you've got Lee Silver, you've got Jack Schmidt, you've got two professional geologists. And Dave, who's like, this is what we need to do now. Let's stop just landing on the moon. Let's really do something geologically there. So they did not only did three EVAs, as I recall, in that lunar rover, but when they landed, Dave added something which geologists would do, which is I'm going to come out the top hatch higher than you could ever be standing on the surface. And I'm just going to look around and I'm going to see what the lay of the land is. I'm going to get a geological idea. I'm going to map it camera wise. I'm going to describe it to the geologists on the ground. So before they even opened the main hatch, they actually walk on the surface. They had a really good idea of where they were and what they were doing. Now that's genius. You know, that's the kind of thing that a lot of the mission planners were like, you want to add an EVA and you want to open the door again and let all the air out. Come on. But Dave's like, no, this is what we're going to do. And I mean, he was the perfect commander for this mission. This guy was like a renaissance man in that you've got a geologist, you've got an incredible pilot, you've got somebody who can land in a deep valley on the moon and photograph it, document it, tag all the samples, bring it all back. And if you've seen him talk in recent years, he can still talk about all this stuff like it was yesterday. It's amazing. Okay, so let's do a run through of all the firsts for this mission because it seems like there are loads, right? So, first stand up EVA through the hatch on on the moon, first three moonwalks from one mission, first rover, first deep space EVA, first satellite deployed by a human in space. Uh, I mean, that's just the five that you guys have mentioned. There's probably many others, right? The first all Air Force crew, um, everybody oh. else who was a commander landing on the moon had either was in the Navy or had been into the, in the Navy. And let's see, it was the heaviest mission to date. It was the longest mission to date, as you mentioned. Yeah, a, a lot of stuff. And then there's all this other stuff they, they added in, which I'm sure, you know, Emily, I want to talk about too, like the fallen astronaut, like the hammer and feather experiment. There's all kinds of stuff. They like, if we get to do everything, we'll add a few more things. And they got to do everything. So they're like, yeah, we're going to do some discretionary stuff now too. Amazing. So the, the fallen astronaut was a three and a half inch sculpture which was made of aluminium it was created by a guy called Paul von Hoydonk and it's a small little man essentially and it was left on the moon next to this plaque which had the name of 14 cosmonauts and astronauts who had at that point known to have died there's a there's a great documentary about it uh I I I need to rewatch it honestly uh I saw, I saw it once and it's really fantastic uh, it's available online, I think. Did the Soyuz 11 astronauts make it on there? They did. The one okay. that di- didn't make it on there was Bondarenko, who died in that, um, they in that fire know. during training, because that was still a Soviet official secret. So had they known about him, they would have added him. But no, there were 14 yeah. people who did make it on there. Yeah, and the Soyuz folks were on there too. Yeah, and um, to talk a little bit about the hammer and feather experiment, um I, I don't think I uncovered this. I think Colin Burgess actually uncovered it. But uh, there's kind of a neat story behind it. The the <laughs> Francis knows what's coming because he's smiling. One of the people who was behind devising the experiment was actually an Australian American. It was Phil Chapman who uh, died recently in uh, April, unfortunately. But um, I did some reading. I, I was reading Shattered Dreams by Colin Burgess, and it discussed. Phil and uh, Joe Allen, I think I think it said Phil and Joe Allen put together the experiment. And so I went to Dave Scott's book. And of course, I don't even know if he I think he mentioned because Joe Allen was a Capcom. I think he mentioned Joe Allen, but I didn't see any mention of Chapman. So I read that when I was like, um, OK, well, I'm not really getting an answer here or, uh, you know. So I talked to Phil because I'm like, OK, who is responsible for this experiment? And Phil Chapman being, he's very magnanimous and he was a total gentleman. Phil credited credited the experiment to Joe Allen, Dave Scott, and himself, basically. He said, I, you know, I think we all share credit for that experiment. And Phil said something like, if he'd just been a little off with the hammer and feather, it wouldn't have struck the moon at the same time. But that's kind of a neat story because I was like, wow. So it actually took, you know, several people to devise 
an experiment. It just shows you that Apollo really wasn't a one man show or a one woman show or anything like that. When I when people see like I wore the I'm wearing an Apollo T-shirt today, right? When I went to work today, you know, somebody's like, yeah, Neil Armstrong. And I'm like, that's awesome. I'm glad he even knew who Neil Armstrong was, honestly, because, you know, a lot of people don't know about that. But um, still, you know, and I love Neil Armstrong, nothing against him. But when people think of the moon, they think of him. Neil would have been the first person to admit, you know, there were 400,000 people behind us, you know, and it really just shows you how Apollo was just the result of just tons of people working on stuff and, you know, a lot of brains working on things. So I don't know. This hammer and feather experiment, if you haven't seen it, it's on YouTube. And I mean, it is amazing. You know, you've got Dave Scott standing on the surface of the moon in front of the lunar module talking about Galileo had this theory that if you remove all the air resistance, a light, light feather will drop as quickly as a heavy, heavy hammer. And he holds them both out and he lets go of them both. And you just watch them plummet to the ground at exactly this, hit the ground exactly the same moment. And it's, it still doesn't seem real. You're watching it going, that can't be, it's a feather. Yeah. It's a hammer. Come on. But it, it works. It's, it's amazing. It's, it's, as a science educator, it's one of the most visceral things you'll ever see because it really gets it. So the fact that they not only were doing all this incredibly complicated geology, but also thinking about things that would impact the, um, the general public like this, you know, Al goes on Mr. Rogers neighborhood, the American TV kids show, Dave Scott's, you know, working with these folks, um, to come up with, with things like this to show people. And then they, they put this plaque on the moon to just commemorate those who died, both American and Russian before them. I mean, they're thinking about what this means and what this is going to mean 50 years later, not just what they're doing that day. And that's, that's true exploration right there. Oh, look at the mountains today, Jim, when they're all sunlit. Isn't that beautiful? It really is. My golly, that's just super. It's still the most beautiful day of the year. If you look at pictures, a lot of the uh, pictures, like portraits of uh, Apollo astronauts were taken after Apollo 15. So there are a couple portraits done of Dave Scott, and they were actually taken shortly after they came back. Because I used to think, oh, they must have been taken before the mission. And I was like, no. And I looked down at his fingertips, his nails, his nail beds. And they're black. And I'm like, that's weird. You know, what's up with that? And then I realized it was because when he was uh, doing some drilling during some of the uh, lunar experiments, he bruised up between the spacesuit, the the fingertips, and between doing the drilling. I mean, he had worked so hard, he had, like, hurt himself. He actually, like, I think he hurt his shoulder, too. Like, he had, I mean, that to me just speaks of, like, how hard this guy was working on the moon, you know? That's unbelievable because I saw this picture and I was like, he was kind of hiding his nails. And then I looked, I was like, his nails are black. And then I realized it's because he bruised himself. It's not only that, it was almost more deliberate in that he had had the spacesuit finger gloves shortened because when he was on the moon, he was thinking, I need to have that tactile sense. Oh my God. Um, I want to be able to do geology. I'm doing geology on earth. And so much of it is to do with what I can pick up. If I can't pick up that rock, I want. The whole, why am I here? And so he had his fingers, um, the spacesuit glove fingers shortened, which almost guaranteed he'd get sort of goffy looking fingernails by the end of the mission. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that is dedication. Those fingers took a long time to unbruise. Yeah, that's to me is like, wow. Like that's how freaking focused he was. <laughs> mm. He was he was super, I mean, they, they worked their butts off down there. So yeah, that's incredible to me. Which brings up the issues that Jim Irwin had as well, right? So he had heart problems, correct? Yeah, Jim Irwin ended up um, being in some ways a victim of Apollo 15 and that it's not absolute, but it's very likely that he died younger than a lot of these guys, um, you know, the first of the moonwalkers to die because of what happened on Apollo 15. Um There'd never been anything quite this strenuous before on the moon, as we've been talking about. And uh, they got pretty potassium depleted. They got pretty dehydrated. Um, they were definitely pushing themselves to the limits on this one. And they didn't really have the ability to do much about that. Um, but certainly when when Dave and Jim came back into orbit to meet up with our warden, uh, it was a long, long day. They'd been on the moon. They packed everything up. They got ready to launch. I mean, it's in a stressful time because if that rocket doesn't launch, they're not coming home. They would still be there. It was, I think, a 20-something hour day for them at the end of it. I mean, they did not sleep. And so by the time they got 
into orbit and docked. Um, the doctors are seeing this rather alarming erratic heart rate from Jim Irwin and, and, and wondering what's going on. They were worried he was about to go into arrhythmia. If you're going to have a heart attack, the Apollo command module and zero gravity is about the best hospital bed you could have. I mean, you're literally just floating there. So doctors told them to all take a sedative um, and to settle down. And But they didn't tell the commander. And this is something that happened a lot during these missions. You know, um, John Glenn was incredibly annoyed that when his heat shield may have failed, um, the ground didn't tell him. Wally Shira had similar issues with, you know, I'm, I'm a commander in a spacecraft up here. You can advise me, but what are you going to do? Come up and make me? I, I, I need to, to know what's going on. It happened on Skylab. It happened on the space station where the person up there goes, I think I, if I have all the information, I can make a very informed decision. I'm kind of a smart person. I'm commanding a space mission, you know? Um, Dave Scott and, and Al Warden were, were very upset after the mission when it turned out that they were being told to rest, but not being told why. And it turned out, you know, Jim had this serious uh, heart issue. What really upset Al Warden is a couple of days later on the way back to Earth, Al opens the hatch to do a deep space spacewalk that Emily described. And Jim is in the hatch, you know, he's halfway out of the spacecraft, ready to get the film canisters that Al Warden is bringing back. If he'd had a heart issue then, I mean, they, they are literally in deep space, in spacesuits. It would take a long, long time to repressurize the spacecraft, get him out of a spacesuit. If he'd have died there or had a heart attack, serious issue. And the commander didn't even know to, to be able to say this is worth getting some fill canisters in or not. So, yeah, um, Jim had about three or four heart attacks before he finally passed away, younger than most of a heart attack. Um, but And it's hard to know whether those are directly connected to Apollo 15, but it seems an incredible coincidence if not. Crazy. I'd never thought about the, the fact that it may have stemmed from that uh, before. By the time you get to Apollo 16, they are loading those guys up with potassium. And that will be, I'm sure, another Emily podcast for you one day when you hear about excessive flatulence from all the orange juice they were being forced <laughs> to drink to load themselves up with potassium. So, But I'd rather be excessively flatulent than having a heart attack. So I think that was probably a good choice. That's not a family-friendly show either because there is a quite a bit of a obscenity. There was quite a bit of language from John Young about this development. Even though, even though I don't think he was ungrateful, I just think he was like he was he was just over like being bombarded with it. That's all. <laughs> I, I won't repeat it. It's a family show, so <laughs> it's on YouTube. If you if anybody wants to look it up, just type in John Young Orange Juice on YouTube. It's on there. So, Fra Francis, you, you let slip with me this week that the first astronaut you met was Jim Irwin. Uh, when was that and, and how did that happen? Yeah, I was fortunate. I mean, over time, I've met all three of the Apollo 15 crew and, and worked with um, Al Warden and Dave Scott. Um, and I probably met them around the same year, 2001 and 2002, as far as I can work out, within a very short period of time. But you've got to go back to 1990 for Jim Irwin. I was still living in England where, as you know, Dave, you know, astronauts at that era were kind of like angels falling from the sky. It's like, yeah, is it an astronaut? You know, this wasn't a... England didn't really have astronauts until Helen Sharma. You know, this is a time when this was a big deal. An IMAX movie would come out and there'd be like a holy visitation or something. Well, Jim Owen, um, I had, as a teenager, I'd written to him and one of the nicest, nicest people you can imagine. I mean, he would write full handwritten letters back to me with all these obvious questions, you know, like, what was it like to walk on the moon? Yeah, goodness knows how many times he'd been asked that. And yet he would write, you know, short answer, but it would be a wonderful answer in the letter full of other stuff. And I heard that he'd he would write letters with the pen that he took to the moon with the ink in the pen was still had gone into space. And I'm like, could you do that? He's like, sure. And he, so I've got all these letters that just a lovely, lovely guy. This sounds like a very Emily story. I think this is a little bit like Emily <laughs> meeting out Warden for the first time. So here I am. I'm a huge space fan. Um, it's around 1990. I'm living in London and Jim Owen writes to me and says, I'm going to be in England and I'm going to be in Canterbury giving a talk. And um, would you like to come to the talk? And it would mean staying overnight, which as a, a poor student, I couldn't do, but I could come down there and meet him earlier in the day. So I come down earlier in the day. He's about to be take this tour of Canterbury Cathedral and I get to go along with him. And I'm finally going to meet an astronaut and have all this conversation. And they introduce me and I look at him and he looks at me and I'm just like, um, um, <laughs> A total carny moment, you know, I'm just like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. Um, of course, you know, he's had this 
plenty of times in his life too. So he's just like, come along with me. And we went on this wonderful tour. And then he has to go back up to his room to get changed, to give his talk. I got to go get my train, but he just sits in the hotel lobby with me and says, okay, what do you want to, you know, just puts me up at ease and tells me all about going to the moon. And it's just the best introduction to an astronaut you can possibly have. And uh, it spoiled me for a long, long time because, you know, the, the next two astronauts I met down in um, down in the south coast of England were two of the most notoriously rude astronauts you could ever imagine. I'm not going to say the names here, but I went from like, oh, they're all this wonderful guy who'll take you around a cathedral and sit down in a hotel lobby and talk to you for hours to like, oh, no, that was even more special um, because he was, yeah, he really took the time with this sort of gawky teenager that I was to, to like make this special for me. And so it was the only time I got to, to meet him. I wish... I had known what I was going to end up doing, writing so extensively about Apollo 15, but because uh, it really has made a difference. But it, it did give me, when Al Warden and I were talking so much about Jim Irwin for our books, it really gave me an insight. When Al talked about something specific, I'd be like, yeah, I can see that. Because, you know, even if you've only spent a couple of hours with a guy, you get a sense of him. Fantastic. Al said he was the original Beach Boy. That's what he said about Jim. He was like, he was real handsome. He really stood out. And he could have used that to be manipulative, but he wouldn't do something like that. He was really just a really sweet person. So I know Al thought really highly of him. I met Jim when I was really little, and I don't think I could. I think I was so terrified that I just did not say a word to him, which is sad because he was very sweet. I think I shook his hand and he was like, hi, like he he was really nice. He knew how he knew I was tongue tied. So he he. He was very sweet. I remember he was really tan and he was really thin. So this was probably around 87, 88, I'm guessing. So 15 was a good looking crew, but I can't talk about it because I'm going to get canceled. So I'll shut up. <laughs> they are a very good looking crew. Even, even I'll, I'll admit that these are, these are three very good looking guys. And the reason that um, Jim Owen was in many ways very buff, kind of like a Venice Beach sort of bodybuilder look is because he was really surprised he got chosen for as a NASA astronaut. You know, just a few years before, he'd been in a horrific airplane crash. And he'd been an instructor teaching a student, and uh, the student had crashed the plane. And um, he was in the hospital for a long time. They thought they were going to have to amputate one of his feet. They thought he might never walk again. They certainly thought his piloting career was over. And he got himself back into shape, and he became an astronaut. And I think that's kind of why he kept going, because, you know, he wasn't going to ever get a little bit paunchy, because it's like, I need to stay in shape because I'm lucky to be here. Very interesting life story that guy had. Mm. I, I'm really glad you mentioned life stories there. Uh, you said earlier how there are now people like Emily and myself who are not just interested in the science, but also the people. And one of the things I find most frustrating is trying to get across the stories behind all this to, to other people. Uh, I, I, you know, I think we've all been asked, well, I get asked by my friends or people who support me why I'm into all this moon stuff. <laughs> and I find it such a difficult question to answer. I often find myself saying, well, why aren't you into it? It's incredible. Like there are stories everywhere, which is so inspiring. There are life lessons to be had and impressive things to learn. And it's all just so beautiful as well. Um, in fact, I've started buying people the Blu-ray of the 1998 HBO series from the Earth to the Moon, which was, of course, produced by Tom Hanks. I I've started doing this because I think it's just a really great way of trying to get people to think of the bigger picture or see the bigger picture of what the moon landings were at the same time as teaching them things that happened because uh, people are so poorly educated on the Apollo program in my opinion. Um, but the Apollo 15 episode of that show is magnificent. They somehow make geology romantic in a way which I've not seen anywhere else. And I can't help but get swept up in it all. Rocks and science become an emotional journey. It's incredible storytelling, but I've digressed massively here. But I just wish I knew how better to make people look up and be inspired. The reason Apollo 9 episode and Apollo 15 episodes are so good is because they're made in L.A., they look around for a consultant and guess who lives in LA? Dave Scott. Huh. So both his missions and he was there saying, you know, that, that switch, that gate should be a little bit over there. And that plus also a lot of input into the story. So his two missions really shine in that TV series because he was there doing them. Um, but it's true. There are so many wonderful stories. You know, we mentioned Joe Allen. I mean, it could be a whole story about Joe Allen. This is a guy chosen as a scientist astronaut along with Phil Chapman for being a scientist. The next thing, 
They're saying, can you be a Capcom on Apollo 15? But this is a geology mission. So he's a, a fourth member of the crew. He's kind of like, you know, the fifth beetle in that way. He's on the ground. They're telling what's happening. He's documenting. He's saying, have you seen on the camera? There's a big rock right behind you. Oh, wonderful. I hadn't spotted that. You know, he's, he's the eyes and ears for them as well. We talked about Lee Silver, but you've got folks like Farouk El-Baz, who, you know, who's teaching out all the geology in orbit, because while the two guys are doing geology in a small area, Al's doing what they call the ground truth, the big flyover, looking at the big picture with all his instruments, with his cameras, with his own eyes. So there's a small and a large, which, are, you know, a micro and a macro, which is exactly what geologists want to do. Um, there's one more bit, though, that I really think is if you really want to grab an audience, and this is something, you know, shamelessly I'm going to mention because I did work with Al on this one chapter. I think it's the best thing I've ever written with anybody, and I think it will be the best thing I ever do write with anybody. And that's the one chapter where Al is around the moon for three days on his own. You know, he spent six days in lunar orbit, but three of them are on his own. He's around the far side of the moon. There's a point where it's the dark side of the moon and the far side of the moon. You know, there's the, there's the side away from the sun, there's the side away from the earth, and about a third of the moon is both. So he's in this shadowed section where the earth can't be seen, the sun can't be seen. The only way he can tell where the horizon of the moon is, is that's where the stars stop. There's just a curved bite in the horizon. So he can't see the moon. He can just see the, the absence of stars. And he's looking out at more stars than anybody has ever seen with a naked eye a blaze of stars so much he's not even seeing blackness he's just seeing a sort of a milk of 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 light and you know it's one thing to read about something it's one thing to watch a movie about something but when you're actually there as Al described it and it's in your gut and you're feeling it and you're floating which gives it a whole other sort of womb like experience you know he's looking out at this blaze of stars he's literally the furthest person away from anybody else there are two people on this other side of rock Everybody else is back on Earth, a quarter of a million miles away. And he goes like, what does this mean? Who are we as a species? Are we the only people in the universe? We can't be. How did, you know, did we come, did life come spread through the universe and end up being seeded on this planet? And we're just like explorers going across the Pacific Ocean, finding tiny little islands. And he's having all these gut reaction feelings to where he is. And then he comes back. And we've not sent more than three people on that experience in, in all of humanity. And it'll be a long time, maybe until we do again. And he, he got a question. He got a nagging question in his mind. He thought about it for the rest of his life. And humanity has not been able to answer it and won't for probably millennia. But the question's there that was never there before in humanity. And so if anything else is important on this mission, it's just this little question that's just been seeded in in our imaginations about what, what is this? We've got this one person who had this experience on behalf of all of us. So I'm kind of, kind of proud I helped write that down because I think that if, any, if I want anything from this mission, it's going to be that. It's like, we don't know the answer, but what a question. Yeah, fantastic. And that's a great place to end, I think. Emily? Yes. Uh, I have nothing else. I think that's great. Just briefly, uh, this new book, when's it out? So The Light of Earth comes out in November, which essentially means October. Um, so that will be the, the one that's for adults. Um, it's not an adult book. It's a book for adults. There's a huge difference. Um, but also um, <laughs> there's Astronaut Al Travels to the Moon, which is the children's book we did and incorporated some of Al's poetry. That's already out. So that's one that you can get from Amazon and lots of other places too. So really fortunate that Al and I were able to complete two books before he passed away. Well, fantastic. Uh, I look forward to, to getting my hands on a copy of that uh, and putting it with my other one. Um, to, I, I'm a completist after all. Uh, but thanks so much for joining us. This has been wonderful. I've smiled a lot and I've learned a lot. So thank you very much once again for joining us. Thank you. Hello, Houston. The Endeavour is on station with cargo and what a fantastic sight. Beautiful news. Romantic, isn't it? Oh, this is really profound. I'll tell you, it's fantastic. So I absolutely love talking to Francis. Isn't he just, uh, he's just delightful. Even before and afterwards, the whole, everything about him, he's just lovely. I think the world of him. What a guy. Yes, me too. Uh, and I'm really excited uh, for, uh, I feel a little biased because I've already uh, got to read through the book that's coming out later this year that he did with Al Warden. And I, I do have the book that he, uh, the kids book that he did with uh, Michelle Roush, did the uh, the uh, paintings for it, and they're spectacular. But um, I'm a little biased because I read the one that he's they're putting out later this year. 
but um it, it, it's really awesome yeah it's really fantastic and uh i don't want to spoil it but y'all are gonna want to get it when it comes out it, it it really is a awesome addition to the uh astronaut autobiography biography that whole canon so it's it's a really worthy follow-up to falling over or falling to earth i don't know if it's a follow-up though it's kind of fills in the gaps yeah exactly it, it I, I it's not like a sequel does that make sense yeah it's not falling to earth too it, it's kind of just <laughs> you know more of a you know sort of the things that maybe weren't well answered by falling to earth are in this one right if that makes sense so Absolutely. but you should also get falling to earth as well if you don't have it please get it at your library don't rob anybody you know yeah, I don't want to incite riots or anything, um, but you got to <laughs> read it. It's incredible. That That is one of the, I think, classic astronaut like autobiographies right behind, like Carrying the Fire, Yeah, the Michael Collins one, and that's a pretty big praise because uh, car- Carrying the Fire is like the gold standard. <laughs> um, and uh, the, the thing about Falling to Earth as well, we, we mentioned it at the start, there may be people listening to this who didn't know much about Apollo 15 and have heard us briefly mention this this drama to do with this, this, the stamps and what happened after Al got back. And, uh, I, I don't think we're going to go into that because the best place to find out what happened, and as Francis said, or, or maybe it was you, Emily, that said it, one of you said it, it's, it's all fact. It's stuff that you can check records of. These things are, are, are factual things. This isn't his version of events. This is the version of events. So if you're interested to know about about that side of it, then Fallingsworth has that story in it. Yeah. Equally, if you haven't seen From the Earth to the Moon, the Apollo 15 episode is a great place to start. If you just want to be wowed and, and feel some of the excitement that the three of us feel f- about this mission, I think that's a great place to start. But yeah, I, it was so great having Francis on. Uh, we, we end up talking for about 50 minutes recorded, but that, that we were with him for a good hour and a bit. Uh, but the, the full unedited version of that interview is up in video form on our Patreon page, which is patreon.com forward slash space and things. And for those of you who want more information about Francis, how to follow him online visit our show notes either in your podcast provider or on our website spaceandthingspodcast.com okay so here i am on my own and my voice is a bit tired from the gigs I've had this weekend. So not only alone, but sounding different to the rest of the episode. The continuity police are loving me right now. Anyway, the news. Launch-wise, it's been a relatively quiet week with just one launch, but it's a pretty important one. In Kazakhstan on Wednesday the 21st of July, Roscosmos launched a Proton M rocket to take the first new module to be added to the International Space Station since 2016. It's called NAKA. No idea if I've pronounced that correctly. It's N A U K A, which is the Russian word for science, uh, and it's also known as the Multipurpose Laboratory Module or MLM which is what I'm going to call it from now on. It will be situated in the Russian segment of the ISS as it was funded by the Roscosmos State Corporation. And it's the biggest space laboratory that the Russians have launched to date. It's going to be used for experiments, docking and cargo, and also have space to be a crew, work and rest area. In fairness, this looks like a pretty decent bit of kit that's going up there. And it can do a hell of a lot of cool stuff. And it's long overdue. Really long overdue. It was originally supposed to be launched in 2007. There have been a number of issues over the years that have delayed this, and even after it launched last week, it appears there may have been some problems with the main engines, which were supposed to help it get into orbit and rendezvous with the space station. However, it appears they've either found a workaround or fixed the problem, as on Monday the 26th of July, they discarded the module from the station, which this is replacing. Uh, This is known as the Piers docking compartment, which has been up there for nearly 20 years. And the astronauts on board captured some wonderful photos of this module burning up in the atmosphere below them. So it's well worth checking those out. The new module is expected to dock with the station on Thursday the 29th of July, which is the day this podcast is released. So let's hope that goes well. Uh, There's quite a lot of detail about the different modules, which I've left out of this summary. So as always, there'll be links to articles with the full stories, not just this, but 
everything else I do going to talk about now. And they can be found on our show notes, which you can find on your podcast provider if you click on the episode you're listening to. Or if that doesn't work or the links aren't user-friendly on your podcast provider, just head to our website, spaceandthingspodcast.com, where you can also find an archive of all our previous episodes. So while it's been a quiet week for launches this week, there are a few scheduled for next week, including the second orbital test flight of Boeing's Starliner capsule, uh, which is due to take place on the Friday 30th of July. Uh, Now, this capsule is being dubbed Boeing's Astronaut Taxi, and assuming this uncrewed flight to the International Space Station goes well, the first passenger flight may well take place later this year. The first launch of this capsule took place in December 2019, but there were quite a few issues with that mission, and NASA reviews found 80 corrective actions that needed to take place before this current mission could fly. It's going to be launched on top of a United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket and hopefully return six days later. So this capsule was part of NASA's commercial crew program, which replaced the shuttle fleet, uh, where they are paying for commercial companies to find a way to take their astronauts to and from space. NASA picked Boeing and SpaceX to develop space vehicles, and the SpaceX Dragon has been in operation for the last year, with three crewed flights now under its belt. Now, talking of SpaceX... NASA have just employed them to launch the Europa Clipper mission in October 2024 on a Falcon Heavy rocket. Now, this is a mission which will place a probe in orbit around Jupiter's moon Europa, with the aim of investigating whether the icy moon could have conditions suitable for life. This mission was originally going to be launched by the Space Launch System, SLS, which NASA are developing for their human, moon and Mars missions, but they've employed SpaceX instead, and the cost of this contract is just $178 million, which is ridiculously cheap for a deep space payload launch. To give you an indication, the Europa Clipper probe is costing $4.25 billion. So this launch saving is probably very much welcomed by the American taxpayers. I'll be sure to ask Emily next time we speak. And while we're talking of the moons of Jupiter, water vapour has been detected on Ganymede, which is the largest of all the moons in the solar system. In fact, it's bigger than the planet Mercury and only slightly smaller than Mars. Uh, This research, which has used new and old data from the Hubble Space Telescope, has confirmed a theory that ice on the surface of Ganymede can turn from a solid to a gas without becoming a liquid first. I understand that. Now, these findings have made scientists think that this could be a common trait with other icy bodies within the solar system. Uh, These findings were published online on the 26th of July in the Nature Astronomy Journal, and there'll be links in the notes if you want more info. And while we're talking about the solar system, it's all happening on Mars. So in no particular order, but up first, the Ingenuity helicopter has now completed 10 flights, and its 10th flight was its most ambitious yet, reaching a record height of 12 metres and flying 95 metres over the duration of its 165.4 second flight. It took a series of photographs to create a stereo image of some ridges which may be considered as a place to send the Perseverance rover. And talking of Percy, Percy is gearing up to take its first rock sample from Jezero Crater. Now, over the course of its mission, Percy will collect and store a number of samples with a new mission being designed to go and collect those samples in the early 2030s. Now, we don't know exactly when this first sample will be collected, but on the 21st of July, NASA officials said that this will happen over the next two weeks. So if it hasn't happened yet, it will do soon. And meanwhile, a joint European and Russian probe, the Trace Gas Orbiter, which arrived at the planet in 2016 as part of the ExoMars mission, has found no signs of gases related to the existence of life in the atmosphere. It was specifically looking for traces of methane and phosphines, but alas, there are no cows farting on Mars. Also on Mars, NASA's InSight lander has been studying Mars quakes and uncovered that the planet's crust and core are quite different from what was previously thought. Using seismic waves to measure the crust underneath the landing site, it has found 
at least two, but maybe three layers hide beneath the surface. And it's also suggested that the core is much bigger than expected. Uh, this is quite a heavy scientific study. So as always, check the links in the show notes if this is something that interests you. And talking of things that might interest you, the new Space Jam movie is apparently very good. I love the original, so can't wait to see the new version with LeBron James playing basketball with Bugs Bunny instead of Michael Jordan. And you may think that I just saved that little amusing anecdote to be the light relief at the end of the news section. But no, that goes to this story. After all the talk of billionaires in space after the last few weeks, and yes, both Emily and I are very much over that conversation now, this story has come out today. Now, you may remember uh, that we reported that NASA selected SpaceX as the sole company to develop its lunar lander for the Artemis program, rejecting the designs by Dynetics and Blue Origin, something which the two companies were unhappy with, and so they're in the middle of an appeal. Well, Jeff Bezos, who we've not heard enough about recently, founder of Blue Origin, made the news today with his latest offer to NASA in which he has stated that he will cover the remaining $2 billion in development and testing costs that NASA are waiting to receive from Congress. But only if NASA pick them to build the lander. That's right. He's going to pay for it himself. NASA have confirmed that they've received this offer. That's how ridiculous the world of spaceflight is right now. So go and watch Space Jam. And that's all we have for you this week. Hopefully Dave did the news okay without me. Uh, thanks very much. <laughs> thanks very much for listening. And I hope that you're enjoying celebrating Apollo 15. I'm off to do some philately. <laughs> Don't forget, in the meantime, in space, no one can hear you stream. Space and Things has been brought to you by... And Things Productions.